Hi, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us for this Dialogue Web Extra. We're talking about efficiencies in the parole system. Let's go to our first caller, hopefully. Sherry in Boise. Sherry? Yes. Hi there. Go ahead. Hi. My question is just about the therapeutic community classes. It's a program that is uh, in, in major need of some sort of... Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is there anything being done to possibly shorten the program or any changes that could be uh, allowing it to be more available to inmates who are supposed to go into that program. Okay, thank you. I'll go ahead and keep you on hold so you can hear the answer. Go ahead. We have a, uh, an effort right now with the new uh, Correctional Alternative Placement Program in South Boise. It's a 400 bed uh, drug and alcohol treatment program. With that program, uh, we have legislation currently being considered by the House and the Senate, actually we started it in the Senate, dealing with a therapeutic community rider. And, uh, and it's, we're looking at adding additional capacity so we have more bed space in our therapeutic community programs for the Parole Commission as well as the courts. So that's, that process is underway. The challenge we have right now is getting that CAP facility funded. But uh, it is, it's built, it's ready to go. Uh, we're looking at uh, it kicking off sometime this summer. And it should, it should really enhance our, our DC capabilities. Okay, thank you for the question. Let's go to our next caller. Uh, Rick in Wendell. Rick. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm a police officer and have been for 22 years. And my biggest concern is, is the death penalty and the cost involved in the death penalty. I'm not pro or con for the death penalty, but wouldn't it be cheaper, since we don't use it, to just commute those sentences to life? without parole and use that money someplace else. Well, I'll put that question to the panel. It, it, it's very expensive to have people, someone on death row. Actually, we have 16 individuals this evening on death row. And the act, actual expense uh, to have a person housed in our maximum security facility is no greater for a death row inmate than it is for any other inmate in that particular prison. Um, the, the, the expense really comes in the appeals process, and I'm sure that I'm sure that, this, that the legislators can speak to that from what their experience has been with, with the overall cost of the appeals process. But the actual housing of an inmate in that particular prison, which is our most secure prison in the state of Idaho, um, is no greater for any other inmate in that prison. Same section. Yeah, it's the same. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the, the same. cost of the appeals. Right. And, it is. And I, you know, I'll step out and say, you know, I, I'm openly against the death penalty for many reasons, but the financial reason is, is, is good enough. We don't have the money to waste on the appeals. We don't have the money, uh, in fact, many counties don't even have the money to prosecute a death penalty case, so there's a, there's a, a, a question about whether or not there's equal justice out there when you, you, you can't even get prosecuted for the death penalty because a county could never afford to do that. So um, really the system doesn't work, and if we lost that system and lost those costs, uh, the citizens of Idaho would be as safe as they are now, and, and I think that, that we need to be looking at all of those efficiencies in what we do in government. Okay, let's get to our Earl and Albion. Earl. Yeah, I, my question was, why not work towards a self-sustaining institution there, other than bleeding outside resources that are suffering themselves? I, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by a self-sustaining institution within the within the prison parole, parole system Actually, let, let it keep itself up Earl, we have we are our, our work head above water excuse me. okay I'm sorry go ahead our, our work centers uh, that we have across the state we have five work centers and they are very very near self self-sustaining as well as our St. Anthony work camp where we do an awful lot of contract work with federal agencies and firefighters out of those those parts of the state, so we we are that. I mean, we've tried hard. Our, our inmate uh, programs have generated and do generate a significant amount of income into into our system, um, and we are continuing to try to enhance that. And quite frankly, in the next several years, we're really going to try to amp that up so we have more opportunity for incomes to help to help uh, offset our expenses in our facilities to the best the best we can. So, what what if you took the opposite end of firefighting and, and took those uh, suffering suffer, suffering force out there that need to be thinned and take those resources and put them into uh, like firewood or etc. Well, there you go. Well, then you have to have someone who will 
who will pay to do the work, and the federal government has cut that particular program back. It's it's because of budgetary Could, considerations. Could they take the resources from that and sustain themselves with it by selling that? That's that's a thought. That's a thought because we have we have thinning crews that that uh, we actually have, and so that's a good thought. I'll 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 put it on the list. Okay. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to add one other mm -hmm. thing about the work centers. I think it's very important. It's an aspect that I think a lot of people don't often realize, and that is the amount of restitution that's paid back by those that's inmates right. in those work centers. I think it's a very important issue. It is. Very good. Yes. I want to yes. finish up this discussion with a couple of Sophie's Choice questions. For all, all, oh. all, I know. Oh. I'll, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I will, We've already I'll, got enough of those. We have enough of those, and I'm going to throw a couple. Out, uh, and if it you, indeed looks like you may be getting a seven to nine percent, we don't know yet, but somewhere around in there percent cut of your budgets. Mm -hmm. What programs are you going to give up? What are you going to do? You want to start? You want to <laughs> um, I, I'm hoping that the department uh, doesn't have to cut programs in the institution and obviously education and treatment might be something we have to look like. It's, it's not, look at, it's not constitutionally required. However, that's how we help people to change and that's how we get people in, back into the community and are more successful. Research tells us that. So I'm worried about that. What are we going to do? Well, <laughs> it's not, a, it's not a, as, as I, I, pay, I pose it theoretically now, but it's yes, going to happen absolutely. in about after that yeah. budget gets set and passed. Yes. <laughs> the challenge, I think the challenge that we're faced with is, is, uh, is it, it's a pretty daunting task. Uh, part of the problem we have, Joan, is that 44% um, of our budgets are contracts. Um, all of our medical, mental health, and pharmaceutical is one contract. Uh, and then we have our state's largest prison, the Idaho Correction Center, that's run by Corrections Corporation of America. So 44% of a 7% yeah. cut on our budget is contracts. So that means that we have to take 44% out, but Off yet we still have the entire 7%. 7%. Uh, we need some relief on those contracts. That would help. That would be a $4 million difference. Um, that, that we would be looking at. We can't, quite frankly cannot cut programs. We cannot cut education. Okay. They're going to they're gonna have to participate in the reductions because we're going to have to reduce some staff if that happens. But we're also going to have to find a way to reduce our inmate count. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just no way we can, we can do one without the other. You just can't take inmates. You know, I mean, our average daily cost right now is $57.44 57 a day. You might take out 100 inmates but the savings is in the staff. And so it's, that's, the, that's the dilemma we're faced with here is, is trying to take a look at our agency knowing that we have commitment. We're at 99% capacity this evening. So we're all but full tonight. But yet we know we're gonna see a significant cut in resources. That means that we're going to have to be very strategic in how we manage this. We have cut everything we can. We quite frankly can't pass any more furloughs on to staff. They're already at a, at a tipping point themselves in their own finances. So it's, a, it's going to be very, very difficult. Is it doable? I think it depends on what kind of flexibility we can get out of the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee and what, we, you know, the, the, what, what, what the governor might be able to work with us on, but it's going to be very, very difficult. And Joan, one of the things that it might also prompt a discussion of is the legislature looking at what is a felony? What should be a felony? What should rise to the level of being a felony that would put no. someone in prison? Mm -hmm. uh, we've had, uh, I don't even know how to, how to really couch it correctly, but the legislature has, has um, passed a plethora of felonies, and all those felonies keep coming through with fiscal notes that say, no. you know, no impact. Uh, you know, you've passed a felony, and you elevate your costs dramatically. And uh, the legislature in the last decade or 15 years I think has gotten away with making a lot of things felonies, and those felonies are now haunting us in terms of what we're sending in the pipeline for these guys to deal with. And at some point, we're going to have to make some tough decisions about like a what, voter ID what, is that a felony? What, what truly? You know, if you yeah. vote without your photo ID, and, what, what and that's truly now a should, felony as opposed to a misdemeanor. What, who should be in prison? Right. Yes. And that's what really needs to be decided. In many cases, many people are in prison that don't represent necessarily a substantial safety risk in society. And one that's of, a difficult thing. One of the things I'm going to indicate, too, because I think it's a very plus uh, for what Director Renke is doing, one of the things is we look at these tight budget times, we are having to do business differently than we've been doing in the past. As we look at when we went through the good years, we did a lot of things just because we had the money to do it, so to speak. And one of the things the director's done, he's looked at his food service 
situation and, and looking at how he can save and what is it, director, one and a half million dollars? No, 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 about a million. About a million, about a million dollars that he thinks he can save by changing some of his processes and the way that he does business with his food service in the prison. And I think that is something that all agencies are going to be doing. And if they're not doing it already, they will be forced to do that, is to look at doing business differently than what we've been doing it during the good times. As, we're, as you're setting Absolutely. budgets, you get your own Sophie's Choice. Do you pay for corrections or do you pay for that autistic child who needs services. That's, right. mm -hmm. That's the Sophie's. I'm, I'm sorry we have, we have run out of time. I appreciate, I know there's more we can go on. <laughs> I appreciate you joining us and I appreciate you joining us for this dialogue. Web Extra.